The value George Eastman placed on higher education and health care is evident in the schools and institutions he helped to create during his lifetime. The Eastman School of Music, the School of Medicine and Dentistry, the Eastman Dental Center, the University of Rochester River Campus. Today they stand in tribute to a man who believed not only that the best and the brightest would come from such institutions, but that they would make Rochester, the town he was interested in above all others, one of the best places in the country to live. Ironically, Mr. Eastman did not always feel this way. By the mid-1880s, George Eastman was fast becoming one of the most prominent men in the photographic industry. His fundamental goal for photography was to make it as easy to use as the pencil. But the art of emulsion making was not a beast that was easily tamed, even for the determined Eastman. After a couple of years of successful dry plate manufacturing, Eastman's company was suddenly making plates that spoiled rapidly and no one was sure why. Eastman knew that reliable plates were the linchpin to his new business, and consistency would be the key to beating his competition. If he couldn't figure out what changed in his emulsions, he would soon be out of business. Only after Eastman traveled to England, the source of most of his raw materials, did he discover the answer. The film emulsions lacked sulfur, a key stabilizing ingredient. What amazed Eastman the most about this discovery was that the suggested source for the missing sulfur was the cows that were eventually rendered into gelatin. Apparently they had not grazed in the usual pastures where sulfur-rich mustard grew. Up to that point Eastman had been able to solve all his production problems through the method of persistent trial and error. But this was a discovery that not only saved his company, but also made him think twice about the value of scientific research. Eastman resolved that to maintain consistency in the business of photographic materials, he was going to have to control every part of their manufacturing and distribution. In some cases, right down to the diet of his raw materials. George Eastman began to rethink his opinions about the value of higher education. In 1902, he began a relationship with the University of Rochester, which would not end until his death some 30 years later. Rush Rees, president of the university, asked Eastman for help in constructing a biology and physics building for the Prince Street campus. Rees patiently appealed to the practical side of Eastman's business sense. His low-pressure approach worked. Eastman funded the entire cost of the lab's construction. As Eastman's appreciation for higher education grew, so did his friendship with Rush Rees. The 1920s were a time of great prosperity and more leisure time for everyone. Eastman felt that being in the presence of great music significantly enhanced his life, even though he was not a musician himself. And it was this passion that inspired Eastman to begin his great music project. If he could attract the best music teachers and students to Rochester, he would create a way to share their talent with as many people as he could and as he had learned from his own business, to achieve the best results, you need to hire the best people. It was at this point that Eastman asked Rush Rees for help. And in 1918, thanks to the influence of Rush Rees, the University of Rochester amended its charter to establish a professional music school. This act would make music of collegiate quality available to anyone who wanted it. And by studying theory as well as technique, future musicians would develop into a class of thinkers rather than just expert technicians. For those who would become musicians, he built a school. 
for the community, he built a theater. George Eastman wanted his theater to show motion pictures and to accommodate a full orchestra so that the general public could also enjoy the highest form of the music he loved so much. When the Eastman School of Music opened in 1921, followed a year later by the Eastman Theater, Eastman felt that he had finally achieved his goal to afford Rochester all of the benefits of music in every direction. George Eastman was also instrumental in establishing a school of medicine and dentistry with the same standards he wanted for the school of music. The idea of combining a school of medicine with a teaching hospital would put Rochester at the forefront of a new scientific approach to medical education. The ever-present goal to develop graduates who were thinkers and not just expert technicians would be successfully translated from the world of music to that of medicine. With such goals came a realization that the Prince Street campus could never adequately accommodate any such project. It was just not big enough for the growing college. And so there remained an important task for Eastman to complete before his work was finished. Although it would consume the majority of his time and remaining wealth, it would give a fitting home to the University of Rochester. All he needed to do was raise $10 million in 10 days. George Eastman and Rush Rees shared more than a deep and lasting friendship. They also shared a vision to construct a greater university. Eastman spearheaded the movement and the fundraising to construct a brand new Riverside campus. The University of Rochester was to receive the majority of Eastman's wealth over his lifetime. He felt strongly about putting his money into ventures that would show him results while he was still living and he placed much of that expectation on the capable shoulders of his close friend, Rush Rees. Rees' leadership transformed a regionally known college into an internationally celebrated institution. He too witnessed the results of his efforts within his lifetime. George Eastman didn't see his gifts as charity, but rather as a measure of how much of a difference he could make. In a speech at Kodak Park, he said, a rich man should be given credit for the judgment he uses in distributing his wealth rather than in the amount he gives away. Although many accolades and tributes were paid to Eastman for his gifts to Rochester, one stands out above all. In this rare recording from the dedication ceremony for George Eastman's memorial, Rush Rees expressed the thoughts of the grateful city that would benefit from Eastman's gifts for decades to come. George Eastman said to me emphatically a year or two before his death, I am not interested in monuments. How characteristic that statement was of his whole career. Yet can he have been unaware that he had been building monuments to himself through all his busy life? So he cherished Rochester as the ideal home for its people, particularly its children. And by all the means he could command, he sought to realize that vision. 